Hey everyone, it's great to be here. I'm Rebecca Tops. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a white female. I have long brown hair and blue eyes. I'm currently wearing the amazing purple Axcon t-shirt. Um, I currently work in the accessibility team at Atlassian and I've been working in accessibility and user research for eight years now. And today I'm going to talk about how to do remote research studies for accessibility. In this talk, I'll be doing my best to answer the most common questions I have been asked about conducting moderated accessibility remote research. These include, how can I include accessibility in my research? What are effective methods for finding participants? What research tools should I use? How do I ensure my research sessions are inclusive? And what do I need to consider in the analysis and reporting phases? For these questions, you might be wondering why I'm only talking about remote research today. Well, right at the start of the pandemic, I started a new job at Atlassian in Sydney, Australia. Atlassian create work management software tools such as Jira, Confluence and Trello. My role at Atlassian was initially to lead a moderated accessibility research study, which looked at the current state of accessibility on our core products. During the pandemic, Atlassian announced Team Anywhere, and as a result, we were working remotely during lockdown. So all our sessions remotely only made me question why I had not been advocating for sessions. For them. And the reason for this is because remote research does have a number of advantages for everyone, but especially people who are living with a disability. These include a person can stay within their own environment, so there's no need to worry about traveling um, or going into like a research lab, which may not be fully accessible. A person can stay like within their own home and take part in the research. A person can use their own devices and assistive technology are set up. Um, like in previous studies that um, you may have users who use Dragon or screen readers um, and they'll have their own settings already kind of set up with that technology. So if they come into a lab and have to use the assistive technology that you may have on your device, um, it might not have the settings there that they use personally with their assistive technologies. So it can take longer or it can impact like the research findings as a result. And also a person is more likely to feel comfortable at home um, within their own environment, especially with research labs. It can be um, quite an intense environment, I think, for some people. And, and I think being at home just makes everybody feel more comfortable. So there is a lot of benefits to doing accessibility research remotely rather than in person. In recent years, I have noticed an increase in accessibility research roles and advocacy across the industry. This includes Google, Microsoft, government departments, and now in Atlassian as well. The reason more companies are prioritizing accessibility within user research is because there's a number of benefits to doing it. These include, it will contribute towards um, making sure that your work conforms to the accessibility legal standards. Um, so like the web content accessibility guidelines, it will improve your designs and the user experience for everyone, ensure, ensuring that everyone will have access um, to like essential key tasks and key journeys. It also ensures that your research is fully inclusive and as a result that your product is inclusive for everyone. Um, I have noticed as well that as you start to advocate and do more um, accessibility within your research, it starts to make people also think about like internationalization, assisted digital and other areas of diversity and inclusion being included in research and research recruitment. And also it drives innovation and improvements in your company. So it also like improves the understanding of accessibility throughout your company if it's used you know, in the right way. So if you invite like stakeholders to research sessions, for example, then it can kind of drive that awareness um, and drive people to understand more about accessibility and different user needs within accessibility as well. 
Whitney Queensbury, who's a co-author of the book, A Web for Everyone, one of my favorite books, um, explains the importance of including accessibility to ensure our user research is fully inclusive. She says that we can reach higher and aim to make the user experience delightful for everyone. That's where user research comes in. You have to know the people you are designing for, including people with disabilities. So she tells us that accessibility will improve our research and make sure it reaches everyone um, and more inclusive. So why would we not want to do this and, and advocate for this? But before you start to include accessibility within your research, you should try to consider the following things. Think about your team and company accessibility knowledge and training. Is there a way that you can provide kind of either in-house training or external training for like your team um, and team members and company? Um, and also training that will explain like user needs and assistive technologies. Check your privacy laws. So ensure that you speak with um, an expert on privacy or like your privacy or legal team before conducting any accessibility research. Um, recently, I came across something called special category data, um, which I won't go into today, <laughs> um, but um, it's good to understand that and, and to work with your privacy team on that. And if you're lucky to have like, a research operations team like we do at Atlassian, you can work with the research operations team on things such as privacy, recruitment, and maybe accessibility training as well. And finally, try to fix any major accessibility issues. If you want to research a digital product with users living with disabilities, you should consider conducting like a technical accessibility audit or QA audit on the products before researching with users. Um, in the past, I've made the mistake of researching with users too soon before we'd fixed um, the core kind of accessibility issues and the core key user journeys. Um, and it resulted in a lot of the usability tasks being marked as a fail, but it was because the product wasn't ready and it wasn't accessible. So I think it is a good um, kind of practice to try and fix any major accessibility issues before and research users. But where should you start with accessibility in your research? You can do dedicated, moderated, like accessibility research studies if you have the budget and if you're able to do that in your company, which I think is great for like awareness campaigns. Um, but one other way that you can do it, which um, I have practiced in the past, is that you can include two users who identify as living with a disability for every 10 users. This results 20% of your user group being users with an accessibility need. And worldwide, around 20% of people identify as living with a disability. So as a result, you have a panel of users um, at the end, which will provide an inclusive representation of the population. This technique is practiced by the Government Design Service in the UK, um, where it's a requirement to include accessibility in your research. And that is where I kind of learned this method as well. Um, and I've, I've used that in the past and it's really worked well in um, integrating accessibility into my research. One of the most common questions that I'm asked is how do you find source and recruit participants for accessibility research? There's lots of different ways, but some of the methods that I have used and that I recommend are you can build an internal research panel. So a good technique is to build a panel um, and you can do this by advertising online. Google and Microsoft do this to find users who want to be involved in like their tester programs, for example, um, and you can like give your information and sign up to be part of the tester program. You can build a panel or recruit participants using a recruitment vendor. This removes a lot of the work around like privacy and GDPR that was mentioned in before, but you need to make sure that the vendor you're working with is accessible um, and that their processes are accessible as well. You can contact charities and organizations. I usually will contact like local um, disability organizations. Um, and in the past, I've focused on um, organizations that may do like digital workshops as well, um, which is one good um, method that I've used. You can also look for digital literacy workshops at libraries. 
um, if you're doing like assisted assisted digital research. And often you'll find, um, yeah, a lot of um, users who have different like needs and, and disabilities as well. And finally, you can um, advertise on like social media um, and you can also um, go to like different forums. So the disability community often will have different forums where they talk about different um, like software and technologies. Um, so you can kind of um, advertise on there as well if you want to. Or I've often found like word of mouth as well. So if you know um, like a Dragon user, for example, often they may know other Dragon users who are also, um, are also users of your software um, or products as well. There are a few things you should consider um, when it comes to recruitment for accessibility. You should plan for extra time to recruit. So with any research study, the more specific the participant requirements are, the longer it takes to recruit. So with accessibility, um, it can, in my experience, take longer to find participants, especially if you have specific user needs or maybe you want to um, like research with specific technologies, then it will take a longer time to recruit for extra time in between studies as well, especially if the product you're researching has quite a few accessibility issues, the session can overrun slightly. Um, and I've made the mistake in the past of putting the sessions too close together. And um, yeah, it overruns and then um, it becomes difficult like moderating the different sessions. So definitely leave a lot of extra time in between as well if you can. Prepare for additional costs. So you may, some users may um, use an interpreter or may need to pay for carer's time. Um, so what I do is I always put an amount of budget aside in case for support costs, um, because you, if you can, you should, yeah, um, pay for those like support costs that the user may have um, and for, for that time as well. Make sure you check that your vendor is accessible. So if you're using a recruitment vendor, as I mentioned earlier, check that their processes and recruitment methods are accessible and inclusive and ensure that they ask participants about any support they may need during the study as well. And finally, adjust your recruitment screener. So make sure that you add relevant information and questions to the recruitment screener to ensure you are prepared for the individual participants needs. I also call these pre-research questions and I'm going to a study with each individual participant. In doing this, you will ensure that your participant has a good experience during the study and ensure that you've created an environment which works well for each participant's individual needs. You can do that preparation with the questions I'll go through now. Um, and I just want to add that I do like to kind of try and add these questions in, even if I may not be doing an accessibility research study because um, you may be surprised that many people may use like assistive and adaptive strategies but may not identify as living with a disability and I think that's good information to know um, and it can help your research as well. Some of the example questions include do you use any assistive technology or adaptive strategies when using our product? If the um, participant says yes, you can ask what assistive technologies or adaptive strategies do you use? And finally, and one of the other questions is you can ask, are there any accommodations, support or changes we can provide during the session? I usually keep this as quite an open-ended question um, and this can um, result in participants telling you that they may need an interpreter, for example, during the session I may prefer to bring someone in with them to the session. Um, so yeah, you can ask these questions and also ask things such as like, if you want to go into a bit more detail, like I usually do, you can ask, how would you prefer to receive the research questions or tasks? For example, um, you can offer the option to have the questions sent via email. So maybe like in a PDF, for example, 
um, you can offer to do the session verbally um, or you can also offer, I like to offer like in chat, so maybe like Zoom chat for participants who may be um, non-verbal. I also like to ask, would you like to have breaks during the session and how often do people prefer to have a break? So um, it may be difficult for participants to sit in one place for a long amount of time, <coughs> especially a research session, which is can be like one hour of time. Um, so I like to offer breaks as well in the session. And are you okay with sharing your video and audio? If it's possible, if you can, I like to offer the option to turn off um, audio or video um, if, if the person prefers either one turned off. When you're planning to include accessibility in your research, Often people ask me what user needs they should focus on for different research methods and stages of the product lifecycle. The following stages and content was taken from the researching access needs posters, which were created by the Home Office in the UK. The first, first method that they mention is um, with interviews. So in interviews, you can research all areas of accessibility and include all user needs. Um, so I see this as like not just interviews, but also like discovery research. Um, and that's where you can think about all user needs. So like cognitive, visual, mobility, and hearing. With paper prototypes um, and mock-ups, you can start to think about like cognitive needs and um, start to think about like language and communication, making sure um, people can understand like the process and the content that's written and also auditory as well. So, so um, thinking about is the way that you um, are writing in your communication, is that accessible for someone who may use British, British Sign Language, for example? Um, so yeah, you can start to think about that communication and understanding within like paper prototyping. With um, prototypes, so if you're thinking specifically about like actual or uh, Figma prototypes, um, you can start to think about color contrast uh, with users who are colorblind, for example, um, thinking again about language and communication um, and cognitive as well. With Figma, you can use tools such as like the A11Y annotation kit to explain accessibility properties and recommended behaviors to your developers. So there's a lot of different tools out there that you can also use. Um, but it's good to research with your users if possible, um, even in the prototype stages. And when it comes to like HTML prototypes, you can begin to research keyboard experience. Um, so like users who may use keyboard only um, and visual as well. So zoom text and magnification, for example. And finally, with production code, um, this is the stage where you can um, get your code like expert reviewed and audited um, to ensure that the work is robust. Um, but you can also research things such as color contrast um, again, um, and then go into like vision in terms of like screen readers and screen reader users, um, auditory. So if you have videos, you can start to research the captions that you may use. And you can also research like more um, mobility around like speech to text control. So um, software such as Dragon, for example, and Dragon users. So once you have your strategy, recruitment and plan, you need to think about what tools you can use for accessibility research. However, the one blocker I have um, come across and still come across with accessibility research <clears throat> is that there's not many tooling options on the current market. So the majority of research tools that are available may only be kind of um, partially accessible or um, don't cater necessarily towards like accessibility research. So I'm thinking like more in depth and longitudinal like research. So my method that I personally use is that I use um, a kind of video communication tool to do my research. I realized that this is more manual, um, but this is because of the tooling limitation that I've come across so far. Um, if possible, I do prefer to adjust <clears throat> the remote video software to the participants' preferences. 
and what they use to chat with family and friends at work. So this might be Google Hangout, <laughs> like what's shown here. What to consider during a research session? There's many things to consider during a research study to ensure that we create an enjoyable participant experience for each individual. But also we need to ensure that we use the correct language, inclusive language, etiquette, <coughs> and consider potential individual user needs throughout the study. So a key point I would say to keep in mind during a research session and in your report writing as well, is to make sure you put the person first and not their disability. So speak to a person living with a disability as you would speak to anyone else using person first language, such as person living with a disability or a person who is colorblind. This is um, what I practice, but I want to say that this isn't universal. Some communities embrace different practices and all individuals may have different preferences. So it's okay to kind of um, ask people as well if you're unsure. Um, and only mention disabilities when it's relevant. So the way that I personally practice this is I will ask in sessions if the person uses any assistive technology or active strategies. Um, I don't specifically ask about the disability. Um, so I'm focusing on the technology itself. And if a person chooses to tell me that information and their personal story, then that is that I leave that to their like decision. But I want to give some useful examples, um, especially for inclusive language guidance. Um, in the past, and when I was starting out in accessibility and, and research, I used the National Disability Authority guidelines for effective consultation with people with disabilities which is a long title. <laughs> um, this guide was created a, lot, a long time ago, um, but it, I still find it very useful um, and it's very in-depth and detailed as well. At Atlassian, we also use our own inclusive writing guidelines created by the design systems team. In the guidelines, there's a selection of like different examples for speaking about accessibility and people who identify as living with a disability. These guidelines are set up to help people within Atlassian. Um, you can access them online and you can access both of these online on my slides. Um, there should be links to it within the slides. Um, so yeah, um, these are just really useful examples that I personally use, but it'd be great to know what other people um, use and yeah, we can share resources. Finally, when conducting accessibility research, you should use the same methods and techniques as you would for, for our research sessions in terms of trying not to guide a participant straight away if they're unsure on how to complete like a usability task, for example, um, and not to ask like leading questions. So the same methods that you would um, in all user research. Also give the user some time to try and step in. Um, an example of this is I was working with a screen reader user um, recently who um, was unsure of what to do in terms of how to complete a usability task. And I said to them to show me what they would do if I wasn't here. Um, and they started to show me hacks that they would use and like keyboard shortcuts that they would use um, to get around it and to complete the usability task. And this was a really great insight to know what they would do um, if you know I wasn't there in the session um, and a good insight to know that the product wasn't accessible <laughs> um, and maybe some tips on how you can make it accessible as well and different keyboard shortcuts you may be able to um, add and use as well. Finally, you've completed the sessions and now it's time for the analysis and reporting. Um, it can seem daunting to write about accessibility and also surfacing accessibility issues um, from the research, but it actually is very straightforward and I'm going to go through a few things that you can consider and a few tips as well. So there are some important things to keep in mind and be cautious of during your analysis and reporting that I want to mention when it comes to like conclusions and reporting. Some things to keep in mind are 
confirm that any categorizations are appropriate and useful. So be cautious um, if, yes, for example, if you're researching with people who identify as living with a disability and people who are not living with a disability. Um, so don't separate these into like categories, for example, which I have seen done in the past. So just be careful with making sure um, the categorizations you use um, are ethical and that they're appropriate as well. Be careful, especially with small sample sizes. So avoid assuming that input from one person um, who may like use screen reader, for example, uh, applies to all people who use a screen reader. So be careful drawing those conclusions from limited evaluations or studies. Results from only a couple of people with disabilities can't be generalized to apply to all people. Um, and you can kind of, what I normally do is kind of put this as a kind of caveat on my report and, and mention that this does not represent all people who like use a screen reader, for example. And finally, explain what accessibility is. Um, it's This is something that I've learned over the years um, that often people may not know what accessibility is and you can't assume that they do, um, or they may not know um, what like a switch device is, for example, if you've had a switch user take part in the study. Um, so it's good to kind of add that as extra information. If it's on a confluence page, you can use like, a drop down and add that extra information or point to useful resources um, elsewhere. When you're reporting your findings, it is beneficial to pull out all the accessibility or most of the accessibility issues for your developers and designers. Um, one way that I've done this previously um, is to create like a JIRA ticket for each accessibility issue. I have mentioned, I have heard um, JIRA being mentioned in quite a few sessions um, in AxCon, right? And I'm sure that everybody has like their own ways of surfacing issues. Um, this is just one way that, that I have done it in the past. Um, and this is an example ticket that's shown here. Um, it's only a template. So it's a template for like QA um, or for myself actually to use um, from research sessions. Um, and yeah, it's only put here for kind of decorative reasons, but we'll go through what it says as well. Um, so in the heading, you can see here, it says example, example defect one, when using the create issue modal, keyboard only users are unable to access any of the toolbar options within the description text field. So it explains like what the issue is. Um, and again, this is only an example. And then we have a description which says, when using the create issue modal, you're unable to access any of the toolbar options within the description text field when using keyboard only. And then in brackets, it says tab and arrow keys. So I'd have like the kind of um, heading and the description, and then I would go reproduce the issue. So for example, here it says, number one, click the create button in the main navigation menu. Number two, use the tab key on the create modal until you reach description. And number three, try to access the toolbar options <clears throat> using keyboard only. And in brackets again, tab and arrow keys only. This, this is an example issue. This, this was a real issue as well. Um, but here we'd have yeah, the exact steps um, that you would have to do to reproduce the issue for a keyboard only user. You would then have like a, a video or a screenshot. I do prefer like a short video clip, either if you can, of the user, um, you know, coming across that issue in your research session, um, or maybe someone else like myself, like recreating that issue. You then write like the current UI behavior or issue. So here it says actual behavior. When using the tab key, a user should be able to access all of the options within the description toolbar. Um, icons. So it explains what the current UI behavior is doing and then how the UI should behave. So how that, how this UI should behave for a keyboard only user. So expected behavior, a keyboard only user should be able to access all of the options and icons within the description toolbar using the tab um, and or arrow keys. I also usually add like labels into um, the JIRA ticket depending on what the product um, needs. 
and what labels they use. Um, and I'll often link back as well in the labels to like the web content accessibility guidelines. And finally, think about like parity and severity ratings. So that it completely blocks um, the user from um, interacting with this like key user journey. Medium could be that it um, creates difficulties for the user. And then low is more of like a user experience or um, kind of nice to have like improvement. When I am showcasing my research findings, um, I like to utilize quotes and video highlights. Um, so the quote I have put here um, from a screen reader user talking about a drop down. They say the options are unlabeled, so I can't tell what I am choosing. If I was at work, I would have to ask someone else on my team to tell me what is happening and help me fill in the form. So you can, like from this example, um, it kind of talks about how a user is unable to independently use the component, but also that they have to ask somebody else within their team as well. So it's impacting the user um, individually on a personal level, but it's also impacting the team as well and team productivity because this component is not accessible. This kind of quote we um, recommend using with like the product team themselves, um, but you can use different presentations for like managers and stakeholders as well. Um, I've found that quotes and videos where users speak about the impact that accessibility um, of the product has had on them personally and at work and potentially business risk as well has more impact with like leadership and stakeholders. Um, but quotes like what's shown here works with like product teams and focusing on um, fixing specific components. Um, so definitely utilize like quotes that come from your research um, and video clips as well. Yeah, thank you for listening today. Um, hopefully I've answered all of the uh, questions I went through at the beginning. Um, so if you want to reach out and get in touch with me after this talk, please do um, on Twitter with, at Becky Tops or by my email, which is hello at rebeccatops.com. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'm excited to hear questions. There's more time than I expected, which is great. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Rebecca, uh, for a great presentation. Uh, and thank you also for sharing examples from your own research uh, and uh, sharing it with the rest of us. So thank you for that. Uh, all right. So we've got a little bit over 15 minutes left and uh, we are ready to jump into Q&A. Uh, let me go through the questions. And for folks that have not submitted questions yet, feel free to submit them. Uh, we do have plenty of questions. We'll try to cover as many questions as we can. And if we run out of time, you do have uh, Rebecca's contact information. Uh, it's in that last slide, so feel free to send her questions directly there. Uh, all right, so the first question, uh, how do you ensure that your population is representative, especially as many within wider society may not be digital natives? Yeah, great question. Um, Um, at the beginning, it's more about building that awareness and including um, users. But um, I think the main thing is to focus on um, what technologies you may want to research, you know, with um, and thinking about how you can get different um, like needs and technologies um, to, to research that. So it depends on what study you're doing as well um, and where you're at in the accessibility stage. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, th that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, all right, so another question is, uh, how are some thing, what are some of the things to consider when doing remote research, uh, when so many video conferencing and VoIP tools 
are not very yeah. accessible. And I guess a lot of us experienced that in the past couple of years with the pandemic. Yeah, um, so when I started to use Zoom, I was concerned that the video communication tool wouldn't be accessible. Um, and I spoke to users to ask if it was accessible. Um, and they told me that because they use, they were using it now during the pandemic at work all the time, that um, it was, you know, it had become more accessible and was accessible for them um, to use, like with the screen reader, with keyboard only. Um, but it is something that I check with participants. I think some of the things that you can consider are um, making sure that you've like enabled um, the option for captions and um, making sure that you ask each participant what their individual needs are for support, as I mentioned with like the questions you can ask. Um, and also making sure like on Zoom, you ask participants to um, share like their com computer sound, for example, so you can hear like the screen reader or the technology they are using um, to kind of surface those issues. But I think as long as you ask those questions before a session, then you can make sure what you're using is accessible for each individual. Makes sense. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question I have is, what if a company's legal department uh, says we cannot from people with disabilities, regardless mm -hmm. of our legal obligation to be accessible? Yeah, yeah but you can come across that um, because of special category data. Um, and it is a difficult one to um, navigate through. Um, I've had to do it myself. And I think it's just about working closely with um, your legal team and explaining to them why accessibility is important to include in research. Um, and also, yeah, but if, if they still kind of don't, you know, are unsure about doing that, then you can, you know, bring you have to bring in like leadership and managers to kind of advocate for that, the legal team. Um, that's what, yeah, I've done. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and this is somewhat related question is how do you keep data private for users who, who identify as having disabilities? Yeah, again, work with the, your privacy team. And if you have a research operations team, they can help with that and setting out requirements. Um, some ways that you can use are um, making sure that only the like product team that um, kind of are working on the product that you have the findings for can see the kind of results making sure that the raw data you have is stored somewhere secure. So such as like Dovetail, for example, um, mm -hmm. making sure that um, any kind of reports or pages you have, you know, stay internal um, within your company. So not shared externally. Um, and also you can, you know, create like short, shorter video clips and just make sure you're protecting the like participants personal information as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. So this next question is related to recruitment. Uh, what are some good practices for recruitment when research, when they're researching their own clients or internal users? Sorry. All right. So it's recruitment and the person works uh, in a corporate commercial environment and asking what are some good, good practices for recruitment uh, when research their own clients or for internal use or internal users, sorry, internal users yeah. or their own clients? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, it's kind of the same requirements for if, if you have a kind of research panel. So if you have a, pa you can have a panel of like clients, customers, let's say, um, and yeah, just making sure you store the data correctly and um, again if you have like a research operations team work with them to um, build that panel and um, if not just making sure that all the information is secure um, and you can do things such as um, yeah reaching out to customers um, if you know and asking if they want to kind of test or take part in research studies um, I think mm -hmm. it is a good way to find and source participants 
Um, but just making sure that data is yeah secure and managed correctly, I think is the main thing. Thank you. All right, so can you tell us about challenges when working with children of all abilities? Yeah, I don't have as much experience working with um, children living with disabilities, so I wouldn't want to like say. I have mint the small amount of experience, but mine's mostly with um, adults. Um, but the experience I, I do have, um, I think um, the research that we did included like parents who came in with their children and and yeah you can work with parents in that way but for me it was more in person rather than remotely i'm not sure how you could do like remote research with children with disabilities thank you all right so uh, next question is if you only recruit based upon use of assistive technology how do you recruit people with disabilities who may not use an assist assistive technology, but you still want to know their perspective? A great question. It depends on the company and how they recruit. Um, previous companies I've worked with, you could recruit by saying people who identify as living with a disability. Um, so that way you can um, recruit users who may not use assistive technology or adaptive strategies. Um, when I say adaptive strategies, I mean things such as like dark contrast mode, for example. Um, so, yeah, you, you, if you ask um, and if you can recruit saying um, you need participants who are living with a disability, then I think that is the best way um, to also recruit people who may not use assistive technologies. Um, but also um, one kind of method I used was contacting local charities and organizations um so say for example um like artist an artistic charity for example um and you can th then think about like yeah cognitive um, disabilities and and research in that way as well but it depends on the company as well and how they recruit thank you all right so this question is a little bit different it's about standard about rate uh for the your testers so so this individual is asking uh, i work to get my employer to pay assistive technology testing uh, but he's getting a lot of pushback and they are only willing to pay around 30 to 60 dollars an hour so do you have any thoughts on maybe how to uh, convince them that it, it's worth the the higher rate um, uh, I've had to advocate for accessibility research before, and I'd say just building that awareness um, of why accessibility research is important. So if you can give examples of done, um, what the kind of um, like business, um, you know, what how it can positively like impact business as well and how it can improve the inclusion and user experience of the product and um, i think that's the only kind of advice i could give and it's something that i've had to do myself before as well like speaking about what the kind of positives are from that um, and from doing it and the good impact it can have as well and hopefully that will result in them um giving more um when it comes to the recruitment all right, so we have a question here, which I believe you answered it before, or at least answered it previously. Uh, the question mm -hmm. is, have you had any success doing remote research with people with disability using Zoom and Figma? I know earlier the question was more generic about using, uh, uh, you know, virtual meetings, but do you have any addition, anything specific to add about Zoom or Figma specifically? Yeah, I have had, um, have had success doing it um, but it was more of a let's say like co-design session and um, so the on um the prototype and things that um well the users sorry uh, gave feedback on the prototype and things that we should consider um i've also done the same on zoom with um 
using like Eggshore as well. So you can, I think you can do that with any prototypes, but I would say it, it can be more of a co-design session rather than a like longitudinal research session. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that helps, but yeah, I can give examples if that person wants um, of stuff that I've done before. So reach out, <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, all right, so I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, what kinds of prototypes do you use for screen reader users? Um, I, like I, I mentioned before, I think only HTML prototypes would work um, okay. for screen reader research um, or researching with a screen reader user. Um, and the reason for that is because you need the production code um well like code behind it to yeah test that um so like a figma prototype for example wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily work but you can um start to help developers with thinking about what they should consider on a prototype um you know it before going into like research and testing all right perfect thank you all right so Last question I have is, how did special category data impact your research efforts? Um, it just slowed it down. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just had to um, find out um, what we needed to think about and include and um, what we needed to do to make sure that um, the participants' data was um, secure and personal information was secure. Um, but obviously, you have to take time working with um, like your legal team on yeah special category data. All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, Rebecca. Really appreciate it, uh, uh, and thank Thanks. you everyone for attending. Uh, uh, just a quick couple of reminders that you can come back anytime to this session page to watch the recording uh, and as well as the slides are up there and they include Rebecca's contact info as well if you need to reach out to her uh, for any other questions. Uh, thank you everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of AxCon and uh, have a great day or evening wherever you are. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, bye. -bye. bye.